I would love for every part of the country to have its own small individual uh, local forest where people, all people would be welcome, where people could, could learn about forest crafts and where, where the, the trees could be harvested sustainably and people could, could learn how to make use of those trees. Our first interview is with a biologist and author who is the writer of The Wood Age, someone who has a particular interest in investigating things. So let's meet the man of whom Sharon asked the question, who is Roland Enos? And don't forget, everybody's views are their own. Well, I'm a, I, I'm a retired academic. I, I've worked for 30 to 40 years looking at the uh, as subjects of biomechanics, which is the engineering of animals and plants. So I was always interested in natural history, started off looking at insect flight, but gradually moved over to look at how roots anchor plants in the ground. Uh, I, was, I was stimulated because back in 1987, the great storm, all the tr that happened just after my PhD, all the trees, or well, loads of the trees in Southeast England were blown over. And I suddenly realised that people didn't know much about how roots anchor plants in the ground. And so I, I moved over and became a botanist. And, uh, and ever since then, I've been looking more and more at plants and trees in particular, because they're the most huge, most fascinating and plant, uh, plants. And I've really enjoyed my career looking at, uh, at the whole range of, of organisms. Well, it's funny, isn't it? The storm, 1987, uh, really did spawn a thousand careers, you know, and fresh ways of thinking. Um, I know for myself, it really opened my eyes. I was a student at the time. Slept, slept through the whole thing, bizarrely. And, and you can hear Tony Kirkham talk about how it really inspired root care and decompaction in trees. But that's fascinating. And, and amongst other things, you've written a really great book, which is good for anybody to read, called The Wood Age. Um, so that's really prompted me to contact you to have this chat because I just loved the way that it tells a story based on science of how we came down from the trees and how we've got to the good and bad of where we are today and where we're going to go in the future. So what inspired you to write this book? Well, over course of my career I, I started teaching about wood and how Im impressive a material it was uh, but I've always been actually interested in wood and one of the happiest days of my childhood was going to a open air museum just outside Copenhagen all the buildings were made of wood all the furniture it was everything was was wooden it was just lovely and uh, I don't know why but I just absolutely loved it that set on a train of thought about how important wood is actually for people in general and through history. And as I went through my career, I actually started to, to look more at, uh, at, at uh, how trees have been important for people, how we cut it up, how it breaks. And I've got involved with a whole load of uh, primatologists who were interested in how in the in how uh, primates use wood how they make nests how they move through the canopy yeah. and suddenly it all sort of came together so yeah. about 15 years ago i really started to think well I, there's some new story to be told here where wood is not just an extra obsolete material it's actually the center of the way that humans uh, evolved how civilization developed and even how we live today. Because if you look around your room, most people have loads of wood all around them. Our roofs, our houses are made of wood. Everything, there's still loads of things made of wood. And yet we don't really think about it. And no one else seemed to have actually put all those pieces together. And I thought, well, this is uh, the ideal book to write. Um, and it certainly opened my eyes because I was fascinated by evolution. And the fact that how apes have evolved and improved their intelligence. And previously, it was thought largely due to seeking better fruit in the trees. 
But actually, before anyone else wrote what I'm going to say in a moment, you'd already worked it out, the clambering hypothesis. Could you explain how climbing around in trees just made the apes brainier? Well, yeah, no, I first thought about this when I was actually in Borneo uh, and we could see that there were orangutans in these incredibly tall trees, 100 or 200 foot high in the canopy, clambering around. They're heavy, heavy animals, almost as heavy as people, and the males even heavier. And the, you think, well, cats must be incredibly dangerous. They've got to go to the ends of the branches and then to the next tree. And imagine if you're a person going up there, that's incredibly dangerous. You're very likely to, for the branches to break. And if you do fall, because you're heavy, you're likely to kill yourself. Uh, that, of course, happens to young children when they clamber about in trees. And so my theory was that they, as apes got bigger through evolution, they would actually have to develop larger brains so they could work out how likely the branch they were going to go on was to break to break and then how and they said so they'd have to have a sort of self-image as well they'd have to have some sort of yeah. self-consciousness to think well how heavy am I what's my effect on the environment uh, and so that's how I came up with the that idea of the sort of clambering hypothesis and then found out that uh, two Americans had also come up with the same hypothesis a couple of years later and, and they actually managed to publish it. Um, that's absolutely fascinating. If you think about what we know, just sort of recent discussions about neuroscience, how exercise is good for us, not just physically, but mentally, and also um, to ward off dementia and to help with mental health. It's these neural connections that are forged when we try something new and difficult. And it's another excuse to think, well done, well-trained, very skilled tree surgeon who are sort of doing this with all their knowledge as well. That's absolutely fascinating. And there were other things as well um, about brain development of our ancestors was that they learned to build nests. Tell us a bit about the nest building, say, of an orangutan and the skill involved. Yeah, it's really fascinating because I suddenly, because actually one of the things I used to work on was, was how, does, how does wood break? and how do, branch, how do branches break? And one of the things you'll be familiar with as a tree surgeon is if you try and break a branch of a tree by bending it, it doesn't break totally off. It only breaks halfway through and then it splits along its length and then it sort of just, and then it stays attached. That's called green stick fracture. And so I thought, well, how is it that the apes can actually build their nests? How do they break the branches off? Uh, and I was lucky in that I had a PhD student, Adam Van Kastren, a very bright and hardworking student. He was going out to Indonesia and he actually started to look at how these orangutans build their nests. And what he found was that they actually make use of green stick fracture and that they sit on a quite a strong branch and then they bend other branches towards them, half breaking them and then weaving them together. And so they make use of that. And then when they want to make it more comfortable, they actually uh, put, put their hands up, grab branch, thinner branches with two hands, break them and then twist them. And so they can totally break those branches off, put them into their nests as, as like little mattresses and little pillows even with, with nice bits of vegetation to, to make them a bit softer. And so these apes actually had a really good understanding of how wood behaves, how, how, how it behaves mechanically. And so they could be regarded as the first architects and they would do, they would build a nest very safe, could stay overnight uh, and, and they could do it in about three minutes, had no problem at all. Wow. Yeah, it, it was just fascinating. And, and we got some nice films of them doing it. Adam went up and looked at how, how the nests were built and measured the strength of all the different parts of the nest. And uh, really, it just left us with a absolute fascination and, and wonderment at how brilliant these orangutans are at, at, uh, at woodwork. That, that's brilliant. Not only do we learn about how they do that and the skills that they have, but it enabled our ancestors to have deep sleep, didn't it? Well, that was the big, yeah, the big benefit of, if you're a monkey, they have to sit on a, a branch high up 
it's hardly conducive to a good night's sleep because he might easily, if you nod off, you do fall off. But having a, a cup-shaped nest like the uh, orangutans do, they can just lie in it, get a good night's sleep. They could get plenty of REM sleep, dreams, reorganize their memories. And that could well have been an important aspect in the way that they, that, uh, that they could develop larger brains and, and better uh, thinking power. There's evidence of walking upright in trees and, and how that was really useful and, again, part of our evolution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people in, in general, people have always thought that we must have evolved from apes that, uh, that walked along on their knuckles, so-called knuckle walking. Uh, but there's increasing evidence that, in fact, our ancestors were, were bipedal and walked upright in the trees. Um, there's, there's recently they've been found a 30 million year old um, ape from Germany, which was bipedal. It could obviously it could walk with its legs. And yes. the advantage of, walk, of walking upright is that you can actually hold on higher up and walk along the branches. It's what gibbons do. It's what orangutans do. And, uh, and so we needn't have come down to the ground and then learn to walk upright. We could do it in the trees where we have things to hang on to and it would be a lot easier. And I think I read in your book that there was um, that Lucy fell down from the tree and it was a terrible disaster. <laughs> it is, yeah, because because Lucy was was one of the first uh, of big sort of big important fossils. It's uh, Austra- Australopithecus, one of the member of the genus Australopithecus, and people used to think that she must have lived in in sort of fairly dry conditions. But now it's it's clear that when she was alive. She was in mostly a wooded situation. And when people looked at her bones, they found that she'd actually have have uh, compression fractures of her bones and green stick fracture of her, her arm bones, saying that she'd probably fallen down from a tree. So that though she walked around on the ground during the day, she probably clambered up at, at night to, and made a nest to keep herself safe from predators. And it was probably an accident while she was doing her sort of evening ablutions or or making her nest that's what probably caused her death and why did we come down from the trees altogether oh uh, yeah well, it's, a, it's a good point i think what happened was that is the gra- gradually africa was getting drier because as the great rift valley opened up there were big mountains uh forming uh, uh down the east side of africa that made the whole co- the continent drier there were fewer trees, and so the forests turned into savanna. And so people would have to come. That the early humans would have to come down from the trees uh, in order to get food and order to walk between between trees. And and that opened up the need to have whole different sources of food, not only fruit in the trees, but also people would the the early humans started to dig up uh, roots and tubers. Uh, from the ground uh, and using wooden tools to do that. And about that time, they were using wooden tools, which they found to be useful. Tell us a little bit about wood, why it's so good at the job it does, the sort of mechanical properties for those who don't know. Well, wood is an amazing material. It's it's a cellular material, of course, so it's very light because a lot of it is air spaces. But most of the material is in long thin tubes which go along the branch and that means they're well orientated to resist tension forces being stretched and compression forces being compressed so wood can take both tension and compression it's very strong in bending unlike stone it, it's it's not brittle it's very tough as well so it absorbs energy and so it's ideal for making it into a whole range of tools Anything that you would want to have a strong handle, anything that it could be used to make spears, it could be used to make digging sticks. It's it's absolutely ideal material, and that's if even when you're just using uh, single branches from trees, you don't even have to uh, even have to sort of shape it at all. It's immediately a fantastic tool, as anyone knows who's picked up a a, a stick and used it as a walking stick. 
Yeah, and um, absolutely. And it's such a simple thing to understand when you think about how something can be both slightly flexible and strong without fracturing. This is a healthy piece of wood, by the way. All of those arboriculturalists listening thinking, oh, but what about fungal decay? We're leaving that aside for now. But um, one of the other things that was absolutely critical in the evolution of um, humans was fire. I mean, how do you think the use of fire started? And and what were the incredible implications to the human race? How it probably started was that uh, that uh, lots of an- lots of animals uh, follow fire. Lots of predatory animals nowadays follow follow fo- uh, like forest fires or fires in open landscapes. Things like eagles and and other predators. They they realise there's a fire and they realise there's there's uh, animals that are escaping it or have died due to the fire. And so it would be fairly quickly plain that fire could be useful. But it's much more difficult to actually control fire. Uh, and that must have been uh, something that humans, that the early humans must have found very difficult. Uh, what they probably did was was find burning embers and then just keep the embers alight. Uh, so they always had a fire. So they didn't have to continually make fires. But once you've got a fire, you're really made, really, because there's two fantastic things that fire does for you. First of all, it fends off predators so that for the first time, uh, early early hominids could actually stay on the ground and, and be safe. Uh, secondly, it cooks your food so that you yeah. can you can actually have. Uh, soften your food. You don't need to chew it so much. Human humans could start eating meat, and 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 that would be very much easier to eat then. And uh, and then once you're around a fire, it keeps you warm. You chat to people. It's a social experience, and so that would have accelerated so evolution of, of sociality and and our social brains. So once you had fire, it was really a game changer. And of course. What do people make fire out of? Well, it's, fire isn't an element. They the the they made fire from burning wood, and of course, wood has it's very very lucky for us in that wood is actually flammable because most yes. biological materials aren't. But wood is once it's dry, and that has been that was possibly the single most important game changing thing that allowed humans to stay on the ground and become even more intelligent and then make it as top predator. Interesting when you start diving deep into the benefits of fire and nutrition, which is something that I'm interested in. So we're told, we have been told, raw food is really good for you. And I eat a lot of raw fruit and veg. But actually, I've really come to understand that once you start cooking any food, um, then it really just increases, your, your body is far more able to take the nutrients from that food which again is good for brain development and of course the whole thing I wouldn't you love to be around that campfire I would the social interaction learning to make tools spreading ideas forming relationships um, all of that was absolutely pivotal it absolutely fascinates me and I actually think we need to go back to having campfires I think with the loneliness epidemic that we've got now I think most people can look back on at least one campfire in their life and how how much they enjoyed it and what a fantastic yeah. time they had. But it's it's and then you get uh, but still people love it now. Still, even if it's indoors, yes. a wood fire, coal fire, you sit in front of it, see the crackling of the flames, yes. and it just makes people a lot happier. And that must yeah. come from that must be a sort of internal thing, some memory. From our yes. early it, it must be a memory. Of course, we can't mention fire without um, sending our great sympathy to everybody throughout the world. And, and recently in Essex, uh, where I live, for the recent fires caused by climate change and um, not wishing to be insensitive to that. And even if they're not virtual, even if they're not real campfires, you know, some either virtual way or some other mechanism by way people getting together and sharing ideas but um but then you go on in the book to talk about why we lose hair 
it's a pet theory of mine that I sort of came up with. And of course, uh, people always talk about the idea that we lost our hair to stay cooler on the in the uh, in the savannas. But the problem is that is that if you if you lose your hair, then you get a lot more sun going straight onto your bodies, and so you'll actually heat up more and have more difficulty cooling down. One of the alternative ideas is to reduce the amount of ectoparasites, fleas mm. and things that go on our body. Because if we we're in a, around a campfire, if you have a permanent residence, then those are much more likely to build up. But of course, there's one downside uh, of being naked, and, and that is even in the uh, savannas, uh, it may be warm in the day, but it's freezing. It gets freezing cold at night because this the skies are so clear, and so we could only really able to have lost our hair if uh, we we're actually already living in huts, which would shield us from the cold night sky, uh, shield us from the cold winds. And so I think that w once again, wood is central in the way that we could only lose our hair because we already had a. A, a strong relationship with wood yes so without the shelter it wouldn't have really worked and we would have been riddled with I mean any parent um if I may be so indelicate which I will I normally am the head the, the head lice years <laughs> and they, body, body lice used to be really common as well yeah. uh they they evolved later on to to, to live in clothes and things but yes uh, 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 and humans are the only primate who have their own species of flea so, oh. so yeah so so these parasites are real really a problem for humans just because we do stay yeah. in that same sort of same place and, and live together in camps and so mm. that that theory I, I, I'm a sort of strong believer in that theory and uh, but it's still important that we have that we, we must could only have done that if we'd had already building shelters Yes, yes. That's fascinating. To build shelters, we needed tools. And, you know, you ask somebody um, to go back in their mind what things were like in cavemen days. Let's just use real colloquial language here. Um, and that they'll have an image of maybe somebody with um, using flints and using a stone axe. But actually, wood is integral to all of that, isn't it? Well, wood's most much more important. If you actually look at yes. reconstructions of early man, if you go to a if you go into a uh, local museum, for instance, if you see early early man, he's always carrying a wooden spear, or yes. he's carrying a deer on on a wooden pole. Well, well, the early woman who's who for some reason is always waiting for him back at camp. <laughs> in not very revealing skins yes uh, she's she's always got she's already got a wooden wood fire prepared she's next to wooden huts there's a wooden wooden sort of arrangement over the top so they can yes. they can burn their um or, or cook their food and if you look at it you call that stone age but there's no stone actually visible in those pictures yes it might have a have a, a, a some some stone which was used to to butcher the meat and or to scrape the hides but in fact they wouldn't have killed things with wooden with stone tools they would have used wooden spears uh, to kill them uh, so the wood in those at times would have been by far the most important material even in the so-called stone age Yes, it's just another example of how our magnificent life force of trees is put forgive the pun, put on the back burner, in a phase of something longer lasting. Is it that um, I did read in your book about the Clacton spear that was found in the 1930s? But actually it does, you think of the Flintstones, one of my favourite cartoons, um, it was all stone, but it is fascinating. And, um, and then you, you go on to talk about Neolithic axes, axes and um, I'm going to have a little share a little cherished moment I had recently on a building site in Essex 
And uh, it was a massive, great big building site. And I was walking around. I met the archaeologist. I can't say where it is because it's going to be written up because it's internationally important. It's really exciting. So um, it's East Essex, and they were they excavated the ground over a really long time. They found so many round barrows, it was almost boring, I mean, I'm slightly joking, where they could see the holes of the wooden posts where they'd been in the ground. But they found these long houses, which there was nothing quite like it in the UK, but um, they matched what was ha- what happened in the Netherlands, proving that we were linked. And they found something in a post hole that was a stone axe head that I could, I had to lay both of my hands out to hold it, and it was still sharp. It was incredible to sort of have that link with history. How did they make these stone axes with the handles? How did it all work together, this creation of tools? The creation, creation of the first tools were sort of, were flakes, and they, they hit the tool, hit the bits of stone together to, to make them flake, flakes. Uh, but if you have flake tools, they're, they're rather brittle. So the, the, the Neolithic stone axe was, was totally new and it, it was ground down to, a, to, a, to be very smooth. A lot of them were, were, they were dug up in places like the Lake District where they had the right sort of stone. They cut them to about the right size and then they spent ages grinding them and polishing them down so that they were beautiful very smooth shape they're not actually mm. very sharp but the big thing is they're very smooth and they act when they were they were could be used rather like uh like splitting malls today mm-hmm. in that when they wanted to cut a tree down they would not hit the tree uh sideways on but much more glancing blow and, and that would actually help mm-hmm. to split the wood and the smoothness of the axe helped it go go through through the wood in a sort of oblique direction and then if you do it all the way round you then eventually manage to cut the tree down so those axes those axe heads were, were totally new uh, uh, and were incredibly important in allowing uh, the new farmers to spread across northern Europe and cut and cut the forests down so they could actually then start to farm they had to have a, a wooden handle of course Yes, and they have a whole new, whole different array of of tools, chisels. They could be made out of beaver teeth, for instance. Oh, and, yeah, and a whole range of other uh, tools to make the wooden handle and to make a hole in the in the in the wooden handle, yeah. and they could put the put the uh, put the, the axe head in, and uh, take it, someone uh, a guy re- did that reconstructed. Making an axe, making an axe handle that they found in uh, up in the Isle of Lewis of Scotland. Yeah, and he found it. It took him about three or four days. It probably uh, Neolithic people were probably more practiced in it, so it wouldn't have taken them so long. Uh, and uh, but the axe wouldn't have been any good, and the axe head wouldn't have been any good were it not for the fact that it had a handle and a very well cleverly designed handle, so that it didn't break when you when you uh, hit trees and things. So it's a fantastically sophisticated piece of equipment, the, 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 the Neolithic stone axe. And to have one in your hand, that's just fantastic. I've had that. and Oh, thrilling. It, absolutely magical. And so it seems to me not only were uh, people at that time using tools to make tools, which is a major in- intellectual advancement, but they had the understanding of timber and how it worked, rather like your brilliant former student, Dr. Duncan, now Dr. Duncan Slater. Very yes. brilliant, yes, and he, he worked, he's worked out how the the, the uh, branch junctions of, of trees, particularly, particularly uh, uh, deciduous trees, how those have, have, are designed. And it was a real pleasure to uh, to be the supervisor of Duncan. That really helped me write the book. And Duncan was the most enthusiastic student I've ever had. Yes. It's a real fantastic pleasure to work with such a talented, hardworking and imaginative person. And, and he's a, I, I find he's typical of the sort of interesting people 
you get when you start working with foresters and arboriculturalists. Yes, I agree entirely. And we must thank Duncan also for his really insightful regular pieces on LinkedIn, where he does a case book of Dr. Slater. And uh, I encourage um, anybody listening to just check him out because um, it really shows over a long period of time because he's worked at Myers Co, which is a brilliant college. Um, for a long time so he's got all these fantastic photographs of how trees change over time but but going back to the subject critical was understanding the strength of branch unions using that in tools and that literally shaped the landscape enabled people to farm to settle and form communities um, and to build boats etc I mean perhaps you could just describe the sort of later Neolithic house, what was it, what did it look like, etc.? There were, there were two, there were basically two different sorts of Neolithic house. Lots of the, uh, the ones uh, on the continent, and I think sounds like one of the ones that you, you saw, were, looked just like our houses. They were, they were rectangular. Um, they, were, they were supported by, by posts, by big, big tree trunks, which were uh, dug into the ground. Uh, the only thing, prim- the most primitive thing about them was they didn't have roof trusses, so they had to have lines of posts uh, all the way down through the centre of the building to support the, r- the ridge in the centre of the, of, the, of the roof. And then they could have wicker work uh, walls or walls made out of split planks and things like that. So that's what they built on the continent. In Britain, they increasingly went for circular roundhouses. Yes. Um, and that has advantages. People will think that they're, they're more primitive. But in fact, if you have a roundhouse uh, and you have lots of roof rafters coming down from the, the centre, if you stick those together with, with, with wood, smaller bits of wood, lengths of wood holding it around the outside, you don't actually need a central pole because that will support the whole structure rather like the, an um, like the, the fabric in, in an um, on an umbrella. I think it's likely that we had these circular buildings because it needed less wood, didn't need so many big trees. Population in Britain was larger than in most other countries, particularly in Europe. That was probably because we have much warmer winters, and so people weren't continuing getting killed by starving to death in the winter. And so if you have a, uh, a very highly heavily populated country, as we did in Neolithic times, that meant that the tree cover went down to only about 25 percent. Even in, in Neolithic times, we cleared mm. the land long before we, you might imagine we had done. And so the timbers were rarer in Britain. And so to have, a, have these little roundhouses, uh, that made it much uh, needed less wood. And so... Uh, it was it was a better the solution for for, for building uh, uh, our houses in Britain. Fascinating. And then we moved on to um, the copper and the Bronze Age. But wood again, without wood, it couldn't happen. Can you explain why? Well, because uh, one of the <coughs> important things, if you're going to make a metal, you have to smelt the metal and you have to heat up ore. To do that, we people used. Uh, charcoal which is of course half burnt wood and that charcoal is also needed to take away the oxygen from the from the iron or the copper or the tin ore uh, to make the metal so wood was absolutely essential in actually making these new tools uh, out of copper bro- copper bronze and iron low so large amounts of wood much more wood was needed to make a certain amount of, of metal than the metal you actually made it. Listen to the cheap lady talk. So around this time, we started making big ships. Why was the ship mast so effective? Uh, well, a, a mast is particularly good uh, because you're actually making use of the engineering of the of the tree because trees uh the trunk of the tree is actually pre-stressed it's in inside of the tree is put in pre-compression outside is in pre-tension uh that means that the tree 
can bend a lot further before it breaks than if you're just using a separated piece of wood. And so uh, wherever possible, whenever people made, made ships and used masts, they made them out of single large pieces of uh, a single large uh, tree trunks rather than out of pieces of wood. And that's much more effective. And uh, but the only problem was how to get be, how to get tree trunks which were large enough. Yes. And that led to a whole um, industry of woodland management, didn't it? And regulations um, and employment, etc. Yeah, well, the problem with Britain was that we didn't have any big enough trees because we, most of our trees were deciduous trees, uh, broadleaf trees, and those just don't grow straight enough. And so what we, Britain did when it came to later on when we were a naval power, we always had to buy our trees from abroad, mostly from the Baltic, or as the Baltic got fewer and fewer trees, we then had to buy them in all the way from from North America or, or uh, and ship them in and uh, that always made us vulnerable to uh, problems with with, the, with our, our our masts being intercepted by other navies yes and um, some problems have not gone away as we should discuss later on what sort of time in history because I'm I'm an ignoramus really when it comes to history I never paid attention at school and I regret that now so when you're talking about the naval age and buying timber from the Baltic what sort of time in history did that start um well Britain really started getting timber in from uh the Baltic from the middle ages Mm -hmm. so for instance Hull where I live that has always been an important port linking and there's still loads of timber imports from the Baltic region into the eastern side of Britain. Uh, other big naval powers also had the same problem. Athens, for instance, imported its timber from northern Greece, Thessaly mm -hmm. and Macedonia. And uh, the Venetians, who had a powerful navy back in the sort of Middle Ages, they had to ship their masts down from the from the Dolomites further up in, in the in the uh, in the uh, in the Alps, they ship them down, and it, there's always been a massive timber trade because a lot of the countries, the wealthy countries, which lived in places where they were where they were broadleaf trees and good soil, they didn't have enough wood, and they always used to buy it from places uh, where there were loads of conifer forests, uh, which were poorer because the land is is rubbish really where wherever conifers grow uh, that's an indication that the land isn't very good and then there was a big timber trade so the the conifer growing countries could get currency from the other com from the uh, countries where there were broadleaf trees growing so it's it's all that's something that I, people haven't really noticed before for some reason. It's really fascinating and it really captured my imagination when you said Venice because that reminded me of an earlier episode of Tree Lady Talks with Jonathan Drury around the world in 80 trees and in that is um, he describes what happened in Venice briefly and it's absolutely fascinating and I would love to read a book about that or see a film about that because just how sophisticated and industrial the shipbuilding was in these ports, all down to the wonder of trees. Brilliant, brilliant. And, um, of course, in house building became, as we move on from the Middle Ages, well, slightly, um, in Essex and Suffolk, um, uh, there were so many beautiful timber-framed houses. We live in a house that's 18th century, part of its 18th century timber-framed. Um, and... There was a tradition of barn building as well. So, so woodworking really took on. Perhaps you could just describe basic sort of timber house building and barn building, which you do in your book. Yeah, well, timber is, of course, an ideal material to make houses out of. It's, it's strong, as I said. It's also, uh, it's also a good insulator, so it makes nice warm houses. But the great thing about, uh, about the... A, a typical timber framed house is that you can have a nice uh, a framed uh, roof to keep the whole structure dry and 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 warm 
Um, you just need to have a, a triangle of wood cut, cut uh, joined together, and that keeps the that keeps it uh, keeps it nice and strong. And then a typical wood framed house in Britain uh, is made of lots of timbers, which usually oak, which is a very long lasting timber. And uh, one of the, one of the most noticeable things about sort of a typical medieval wood framed house is that the upper floors sort of extend out about further out than the lower floors, which seems a very strange sort of design. But what's actually happening is that the big benefit of that is that the floor joists are actually help that actually bends the floor joists upwards so they don't sag in the middle. Oh. So you can have a ha the upper so the floors are much more flat in the upper stories. And uh, and that's that was that's a very clever design. The only problem is if you have houses built uh, quite close together, then their win windows further up get closer and closer together. Yes. And that's thought to be one of the problems how the Great Fire of London oh, uh, yes. travelled so so easily because the flames could travel very easily uh, in between the houses. And it wasn't actually the wood frame that, that burnt. Wood frames are quite resistant to being burnt. Uh, the fact is that the walls were made of sort of wicker work. Yeah. Wittle, wattle and daub, as it's called. Wicker work with, with sort of plaster and bits of wool and things in between to, to make it water, water, water and airtight. And that easily bursts into flame. And so that's the main reason, why, another reason why London uh, burnt so quickly and so devastatingly back in, in 1666. Um, and I did learn a little bit about making a barn. Um, I'm not continually plugging our podcast through this podcast, but the Barn Club, um, where they're making these old elm barns again with the community. And um, we learnt about how they use various tools, how they got people who'd never used woodworking tools before to actually create this fantastic barn and had a barn raising day and there is something innately satisfying and wholesome for the mind as well as the body about working with wood and there's a real revival in sort of these sort of crafts which is fantastic yeah that sort of green woodworking you, yes. you actually it's much easier to cut wood when it's still soft when it's still fairly damp and then you can you can cut it you can you can shape it very easily using using adzes and all sorts of primitive tools splitting it along its length very easily and then you can put it together make your sort of frame make your your structure and then as it dries out it'll just get tight and and get stronger and stronger and green woodworking is is becoming more popular both making houses and, and barns as you say or also making chairs mm. making a whole range of range of of small items and people are really enjoying that opportunity to get back and actually play with wood work it and gives you a fantastic uh, feeling and and, and uh, sense of, of, of well i would say word, i i of, would say belonging to the universe really there's a sense of wholeness about it you know which something that plastic can never do yeah that's right and so your book goes on to describe how um, history in terms of the industrial age, the use of iron and the various forms of iron where wood is absolutely integral to that. But there was a couple of sentences in the book that really struck me um, about in America with the, the railway lines being built and um, cheap wood pulp and newspaper and, and also books as well. And, and how important that's been to the evolution of society and thinking. Um, you mentioned the suffragette movement, and we've talked a lot about the mechanical properties of wood and how it's made us evolve as humans, but let's not forget the printed word. Very much so, because uh, before people made paper out of, out of wood, they made it out of fabric, out of old, uh, old clothes. And so that's why, why the rag and bone man used to come round to collect yes. your rags that you make turn into paper and the bones to make into into glue so um it was very important they said but the sorry it was the trouble with that is it expensive there just weren't enough old clothes to go round and so it was a great breakthrough when people managed to learn how to make paper out of wood to 
mash it up into the right sort of shape and to remove the lignin, which is a big problem yes. with various chemical processes. And once they've done that, then newspapers could become cheaper. People could learn more, have more gossip columns, have much more yes. interest in yes. newspapers. And then people could afford to buy, to, to buy novels. And you started to get novels which are about ordinary people. And my favourite book of all is uh, Diary, of, Diary of a Nobody, uh, which is set in the late 19th century, uh, 1890s. And it's just about a, a clerk in his everyday life. And for the first time, you actually felt that this was a person who was just like us. All the previous Ooh. books, things like Jane Austen, yes. George Eliot, they're all about people you think there was, they were mostly wealthy, uh, but they were always they behaved in ways like us, but really were quite different. Whereas these were people who he had a had a sort of slightly scapegrace son who who was into betting and amateur dramatics. Do you read Three Men in a Boat? There's about it's oh about yeah, three, I've read that. Th three blokes going out on a jaunt. These were yes. like people you'd actually know today. And, yes, and they were. It was it was the first time that that literature was was produced for and about people of that sort of class that the intellectuals hated those sorts of books they actually loathed them they thought they were terrible but it's it was sort of fantastic i think it really yes. opened up the whole world of literature and and knowledge and things and and sheer enjoyment and um and that's all down to the fact that you can make your books cheaper because they were made out of out of out of wood so there you go, evolution of ideas, evolution of the brain, um, good ideas being spread. Of course, there is always a downside, but I'm heartened by the fact it is, if we may call it a digital age, I use the term loosely, people still love to hold a book. I mean, I've, been hold, I've held up two books during this interview. I love the touch of books, the smell of books. I love looking at them on my bookshelf. There's still about 70, 70 to 80 percent of books are still printed you would think that that ebooks had taken over but people just love hand holding books yes holding all wooden objects exactly that must be what it is roland i love that and you take us right the way through to today and you discuss something that i found fascinating and surprised me was what you call the deforestation myth yeah well people think that that well, there's a lot of talk about the terrible aspects of deforestation that if you deforest an area then it will automatically become a wilderness but of course we live in Europe we live in Britain where we cut down our forests five or six thousand years ago and our land is still perfectly good so if you're if you live on good la uh, good good soils which grew uh, broadleaf trees then the, the, the deforestation has actually little effect uh, on, on the soil quality. You can still grow plants extremely well. The, dang, the difficulty if you, is if you deforest an area which is, used to have conifers on it, it, it's much more likely to cause devastation. Or if in a tropical rainforest, you can also, you, because of the heavy rains, you can also get a lot more leaching and destruction. But even though, even a rainforest, they can regenerate in about 20 or 30 years. Uh, the, if, if you know the film, The African Queen, uh, it's a film with Humphrey Bogart and uh, Catherine, Catherine, uh, Hepburn? Catherine Hepburn, that's it. Yes, yeah. uh, Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn, they, they're, going, they're going down a, a river. Uh, a lot of it was filmed on, the, on an area of, of rainforest in in Africa, which they cut down for the film, and uh, and then filmed on it, but no one knows really knows where it is now because the whole re rainforest is regrown really up around it, and so we, in the past, a lot of the Amazon, a lot of Southeast Asia, a lot of Central Africa, uh, used to be farmed, had been cut down for farming, but we we just didn't know that until recently because oh. it had all regenerated in recent centuries particularly amazon a lot of the people had died when the first european colonists came in they they succumbed largely to infectious infectious diseases like influenza um and those and 
once they, the, the forest came back, regrew again, and it's only recently that people are realizing that you can actually live permanently if you're careful uh, in a rainforest situation. So deforestation isn't necessarily uh, a, a terrible thing. But the way we're doing it now by devastating huge areas all at once actually is, but it's not such a big problem, uh, wasn't such a big problem in historical times as so people used to think. In a small patchwork way, it's um, there is hope. It's when it is um, wide scale illegal logging um, and then soil erosion and inappropriate use of the land, displacement of the ecology and indigenous people. Um, yes, yes, such a massive subject for a future podcast. But um, what of the future? How can we change the mindset of, let's say, we've always done it this way with concrete and plastic? You know, there, there is a lot of innovation there, but how can we say increase the use of timber in construction well one of the big uh, positives about timber in construction is that people are is that recent times people have developed these new uh, lab wood laminates which allow you to make wooden pillars and wooden piece, pieces of wood in any shape you can make them curved you can make many size and that has really opened uh, wood up to be more competitive with the other materials you can you can uh and so nowadays there's huge uh huge skyscrapers being built with wood laminates large sports halls and uh, and large greenhouses and things for instance Hyde Hall down in Essex where you are oh, uh yes. the the main building there is a fantastic wood laminate structure built just like a um, like a medieval barn, but with glass around the outside, rather than rather than uh, having it having a, a wooden roof or a tiled roof. And uh, these people really love these buildings because they're wooden, they're big and airy. They have the benefits both of a of a big modern concrete building, but also a wooden building because it's nicer to be in. And so I think that that's those buildings are really taking off. They're good at resisting fire as well, surprisingly, because the timbers are so, these wood pieces of wood are so big that they just oh. only char around the outside. So I think that's a real benefit for industrial uses of wood. Uh, and people are even making, uh, supposedly making glass uh, out of wood. By, yes. by, by, impreg by getting rid of the lignin in wood and impregnating the, the cells with bits of plastic so they, they can make sort of windows and things out of, out of wood. So there's a fantastic uh, technological breakthrough. But I think where hearts and minds are going to be one is probably in cities where people need to, to, to learn about how fantastic wood is. I think people love the trees already. One downside about urban uh, arboriculture is that people don't actually use the wood when they cut the trees oh, down. I'm they just make make it into sort of sawdust and things. And you yeah. think that's a big waste and you could really get people interested if you manage to, to have a sawmill and to, and to have a new industry. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's a passion project of mine. So, and I'm very pleased to report that there are a couple of, um, I'm sorry to be London centric folks, but there are a couple of um, sawmills in London that take the urban trees that are being felled for whatever reason and uh, seasoning them. And there is even one sawmill, which is a charity called Goldfinch, where they have local people use the timber and they are being used for sculpture, for furniture. Um, London Plain, for example, as, as you and I know, is a beautiful furniture um, timber. And now this is being linked with development. So one of my own projects was where we had to take some trees out for development, half a dozen trees. We've got a sculpture artist to work with a local school and created sculpture and musical instruments and a, a sculpture for the park. And um, another project where um, Luke Fay of Treework Environmental Practice was working on with Lantern, 
they use the timber from the Haygate estate to create some beautiful pieces of art. Um, and there is a real movement, there's a real hunger for it. And um, I'm very positive there might be some guidance about that coming shortly. I'm going to have to keep you guessing about that, listeners and Rollins, but I'm, 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 something might be happening there. So there's a hunger for it. Oh, good, because I think that that is a really fantastic opportunity. Yes. And it always annoyed or annoyed me that that, that opportunity had been missed and that, or even growing coppice trees yes. in, in urban areas, which would be fantastic for the environment and biodiversity as well as for producing useful useful quantities of wood which you could convert into uh, into things like charcoal and other other things and that, that, that's again once again reconnecting humans yes with with the natural world and I think that given that would be a, a fantastic opportunity and it just needs imagination and and think and people in Britain thinking oh we can we can use trees just like they do on the continent yes because you know, they're much more used to to using trees I met a guy once who had his own mobile mobile sawmill he just drove around France and he saw like like a sort of walnut tree and which was going to be cut down and he yeah. sawed it all up and made thousands of pounds out of the fantastic walnuts and, yeah. and, and it just stop, stops the waste that we have there's going to be loads of ash coming onto the obviously oh, market and things yes. that are terrible but there's there's a whole things we could do uh, and people could reconnect and I think they'd be make a lot of people very happy. Well, what I'm also really pleased about is that um, the whole circular economy that's embedded in the new L- London plan, um, and and certainly myself and, and and others are putting in there a borough cultural report, the reuse of the timber. You know, this this could be used for this, that, and the other. And I'm I'm very greatly encouraged by that, and recommend it to everybody to think about the end use of the product. For people and the planet, to put it simply, and it's the idea of having something of local provenance. So um, that's a great thing. But we've still got a massive problem in the UK in that we import 80% of our timber. And when we were talking about shipbuilding earlier, you said it's almost almost a vulnerability of medieval times in, in having to trade with Baltic states, etc. And um, and we're, we're get, we could really be in trouble again and so I applaud the sort of efforts of trying to get more homegrown timber grown in Britain who I'll be interviewing very soon um, just to get people to understand that we need productive sustainable forest management for timber and of course for for nature and people as well so so that's a real challenge isn't it yeah I think so and, and they uh, I don't think and they needn't be horrible conifer forests like they've they've grown ever since the first world war i mean the france has a fantastic tradition of 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 deciduous woodland grown with trees very straight beautiful that our borough culture is absolutely fantastic uh, we could have equally good forests ourselves and with high biodiversity and and with a lot of beauty and a lot of amenity value. We just need to think a bit, a bit more imaginative about the, the trees we choose to, to grow and the way we, and be more careful about the way we grow them rather than thinking in a sort of factory farming technique. We need to, to be a bit more imaginative, I think. There is a legacy of that. And again, um, it's not that I'm an eternal optimist, but I mean, I see a real definite change in terms of say continuous cover forestry mixed species forestry because we know now about the the risk of host specific pests and diseases coming out wiping out an entire forest um, and actually integration with clever planting design and layout so we maximize biodiversity so again that's moving in the right direction um, and it needs to because we've got so many competing demands on a, on a forest and woodland to deliver everything. And of course, we've got our new market, um, our carbon market. So it's all those balances of getting that being um, not just for carbon alone, but because uh, you just plant Sitka, but if you, you plant a whole wide range of different species, it's a different sort of quality of carbon credit. It's a fascinating new world. That's, that's great news, actually. I have a brother, actually, who who is who works on tree 
three diseases and he's been richer than us and he's, yes. he's, he's always trying to encourage foresters to plant more local species he's particularly yes. worried about imported Corsican pine bringing a mm-hmm. disease which is which is killing a lot of Scots pine and and I think that that's something that something that people need to think more seriously about as well mm-hmm. in mm. the way that in the way that we need I'm not sure what the obsession is with with exotic timbers and but but foresters for a hundred years have seemed to be obsessed with bringing new trees in and obviously it works to some extent but there are dangers and I think we need to think more uh, yeah think a bit more seriously about what possible dangers about those sort of trees. I, I, I think it's happening. I mean, I've just, um, there was a recent Climate Smart Forestry Conference at the Institute of Chartered Foresters, which really looked at all of that. But Roland, we could chat for hours and hours. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, and how I want to go back in time in a time machine and sit around that campfire. Um, absolutely fascinating. And I we ask all of our interviewees, what is your dream scenario? What would you really like to happen if you could wave a magic wand and think, oh, I would love... I think I would, I would love for every part of the country to have its own small individual uh, local forest where people, all people would be welcome, where people could, could learn about forest crafts and where where the, the trees could be harvested sustainably and people could, could learn how to make use of those trees. So it would be good for amenity, for, for conservation and, uh, and for making useful objects. And that's a way that we could actually reconnect with our past and, and become once more people who actually use and love trees. Oh, well, Roland, thank you so much for speaking to Tree Lady Talks and for your book, The Wood Age, which quite rightly places wood at the centre of our lives. Thank you very much indeed. So, Sharon, what did you uh, take away from that interview? Just how deeply entwined our evolution is with trees. The fact if we couldn't have slept safely in a nest in a tree, our brains wouldn't have developed. If we couldn't have cooked with fire, we wouldn't have had so much nutrition enable us to be the people we are today. And how wood is absolutely part of our culture, and yet it's been undervalued. We talk about the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, but really we're all about the Wood Age. I love speaking to Roland. And next week we're going to be all about dressing up as a fish almost, aren't we? We're going to meet somebody who knows somebody who dressed up as a salmon. Well, I mean, it's actually, that's a lot of fun, but actually it's a really serious subject. I know there's a serious side to it, I know, but that's just my comedy outtake from it. Well, we're going to be speaking to Lindsay Borgon, who has written Tree Thieves an incredibly deep and sensitive exploration on tree poaching. And Sharon, you've got some news about our Twiglet episodes. Yes, we're going to be doing Twiglet episodes (laughs) every Wednesday, which are going to be about 10 minutes. So I'm either going to revisit a previous episode or we're going to do a mini podcast and a little trailer of what's coming on this Friday. So tune in every Wednesday as well for your Twiglet Tree Lady Talks. We might have Twiglet question of the week, you never know. Yeah. Two reminders from me before you go. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would be great if you could share it with your friends and family and consider subscribing to the show to make sure you don't miss any episodes. You can find us on Instagram at Tree Lady UK and on the website treeladytalks.co.uk and if you just want to get in touch send me an email to noel at treeladytalks.co.uk 